G'day, welcome to Bootlosophy. And if you're new here, my name is Tech. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I live on here in uh, Perth in Western Australia, who are the Wajik people of the Noongar Nation. Now, I'm really excited today because uh, I'm meeting uh, the founder of one of my favorite boot brands, Parker's brand, and it's Andrew Savisco. Welcome, Andrew. How are you going today? Hey, Tick. How are you? Not too bad. Um, we have a, f a few logistics issues and we tried to set up because we're exactly 12 hours apart. Like it's uh, 8 a.m. on yeah. a Saturday morning for me and what, 8 p.m. on a Friday night for you, right? 8 p.m. on a Friday. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, it can be it can be a doozy sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I made a joke that I was having a coffee and after your day, which I'll explain in a minute, you probably need a, a wine or a beer, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, like, yeah. It's been a, oh yeah. We we all have them though, so. <laughs> yeah. And today's special because you dropped your autumn winter collection, right? I did. Yeah. So today was the main drop of the autumn winter collection. Um there still will be some items just kind of straggling out uh more toward the end of the year here. Um one of the uh, social media posts that I did recently was for the Bidwell and the Bidwell 2.0, which were just kind of our standard derby slash derby work shoe, whatever. I know there's like everyone calls it something different, right? So, yeah. um, that's, <laughs> but that's, um, you know, those are on deck too. So, um, probably should finish up around like Thanksgiving, I would think, but, you know, um, probably won't be available until probably around, uh, Maybe like early mid December, something like that. So, and then we have the. I'm bringing back the Delaware, but I'm running it with Seidel uh, natural double shot leather. Um, something about that leather is just so supple yeah. and and smooth, and it's a very clean, consistent hide for it being a natural colored bovine article, which is it's uncommon. Um, but anyways, yeah, so, you know, that's that's on deck, too. So, you know, there's a couple other things, too. But, you know, we'll just see how everything pans out, right? So, yeah, a lot of stuff to be excited about this season, I think. Yeah, I'm very excited about the Delaware. I think a lot of your fans have been waiting for that for a long time. Yeah, it's been, I've definitely received some interest in it. So, um, you know, that's kind of what led to the decision to rerun it here. Um, and yeah, so, you know, once it's, once it's done, I'm excited to see how the batch is going to turn out and, uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah. For those who don't know, the Delaware is a broke cap toe. Um, and I saw yeah. in, in your seconds that you had an example, but I read the note saying yeah. it wasn't going to production. I went, Oh, <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> so with, with that one, we were doing, um, See, not to get not to get like too off off track or off topic, yeah. but I this question comes up a lot, right? Like especially regarding like factory seconds and samples. Um, I a, a decent amount of people do ask, you know, well, how, how, what, what's going to make it to production? You know, if I see this thing in the sample section, is it actually going to be produced? And um, the the truth of the matter is, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. There's no real certainty. Um, what we do is, you know, we'll we'll experiment with different patterns. Um, we'll put these, we'll pull these patterns over different lasts and finish them with maybe some different soles. Um, you know, like right now we're doing just the in-house rubber studded one yeah. uh, for the majority of this season. Um, so, you know, in, in the seconds and sample section, you know, those are the types of samples you'll mainly see. I mean, it's just kind of like one-off type of developments that just get fully ran through production and um you know sometimes we do run production on that exact boot other times we don't other times you know they're just boots that are uh just overstock or you know they were laying around and never got inventoried for whatever reason and you know it, it just kind of just random stuff um but you know, a lot of what appears there usually is uh size grading and I, I try to put that in the, 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 the grading scale that I use. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the size grading stuff is just when we run production, we start at, you know, we, we try to do it through like men's seven, seven and a half through men's size 13, maybe right. sometimes, 15, but we haven't ran a stock 14 in a long time. 
Um, but so like a lot of what that'll be is, um, we'll, we'll try to see how the patterns fit every size of the last through production. And to do that, we want to test like somewhere in the middle of that range, which just happens to be typically a nine and a half or a 10. Uh, right. Sometimes we'll get some eights in there. Sometimes we'll get some 11s or 12s in there just to see how kind of like the outlying ends of the spectrum turn out with the pattern combination, with the last combination. So it's um, it's it's wildly unpredictable, um, you know, <laughs> as to their availability, um, just because like there's there's always something happening like there's always right. something going through right so um but yeah i mean so that delaware pattern like you know um now that i've talked your ear off about factory seconds and samples <laughs> um that, uh, is it, so the delaware model specifically you know that was one of the patterns that we wanted to test out to see how it would how it would look how it would feel and fit um mainly against like people's like ankle and insteps and like every every tweak or adjustment or change that I do to the pattern um you know there, there's there's usually a reason behind it um even if it's just to freshen things up like very much this season has been for it. um but you know with that one we just wanted to see like how something like uh, uh a counter pocket stitching would look without the counter pocket being actually external um with that wanted to kind of switch up a little bit of the stitching lines going across the top of the quarters, but like going down rather than at a sharp angle, maybe have it take a bit of a curve and then just go straight down into where the quarter meets the vamp type thing. So it's honestly, it's, it's nothing like, you know, crazy ingenious, right? <laughs> it's just little tweaks and things that we try to do just to see how things will ultimately turn out. So it's very subtle because um, I don't think a lot of uh, your buyers will sort of realize until you've have like, you know, six pairs of Parkers in front of you that they are just yeah. subtly different that you don't really notice it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's on, that's, that's on purpose. And I can understand where, you know, a lot of people may even be turned off by that because there's probably a group of people out there who want that consistently same One thing, yeah. at yeah. the time, it's reliability, it's dependability, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I guess like what I wanted to try to, what I want to try to, ugh, can't talk tonight. It's Friday night, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what I wanted to try to do with, with that, more like the reasoning behind why I do that, is to make each pair with each season or each year just like a tad bit more exclusive to somebody. So like somebody can say, oh, you know, I got the, the, the snuff moose Allens. These were the ones from, what are we in? 2022 <laughs> or <Yeah>. spring, <laughs> um, you know, or maybe, you know, I got the, uh, the Niagara Mahogany's when they first launched with the commando soul. And those were the 2022 ones. Like right now right. we switched rubber studded one. That we're making. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more or less the idea, you know, switching up the components, switching up the patterns a little bit. Again, like I said, it's nothing, you know, revolutionary or ingenious, but it's just kind of like this little touch I've been wanting to put on more or less every run just to kind of make it just a little bit more exclusive to somebody. Yeah, but that's a good segue to your history because I'm I'm uh, I'm titling this video when I upload it, a retrospective of Parkhurst. So um, I think your history is quite well known. I, I bang on about it every time I review one of your boots, but let's hear it sure. from the horse's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> um, when, when did you start and, you know, why did you start? Stock analyst, a boot maker, what's going on? Yeah, so um, I didn't actually start selling uh, Parker's boots until it's like November of 2018, actually. So coming up this, this fall is really going to be... Um, you know, the five year anniversary here. Um, that year is, or no, we're in 2023. My apologies. Um, <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Maybe I should have brought that beer. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, that first quote unquote year uh, consisted of maybe like 30 to 45 days in business. <laughs> so it was 
I don't really count that as being like as 2018 being my first year in business, even though like on paper it was right. Um, so really, I look at, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. So um, and even this year. So like it's it, it's been quite a quite a ride. Right. Um, so I used to be a, a, a stock analyst for one of the big banks, and it's it's what I wanted to do after college. And I was doing it for I was doing that for about four and a half years or so after college, too, because I had this idea for Parkhurst in the back of my head. And, um, you know, frankly, and to be very honest, I didn't really know how I was going to get there at the time, but I knew that I needed to make a substantial investment in production and, in, and with partnering with a factory and establishing relationships with suppliers and stuff. So, you know, that was that was part of it. Right. So, you know, I, I eventually got to a point where, you know, I had about three straight years in a row, maybe maybe four in a row where I was working at the bank and we were putting in, um, you know, a 65, 70 hour week was pretty typical. Um, there were a few times where I was pushing 80, 82, 84. Uh, that was that was crazy. I mean, you, you become a you become a different person like yeah. after you that. I, I want to say after you pass the 75 hour <laughs> mark, but it was just like, a, it was just a, it was just a lot. Right. But I knew that, you know, I, I needed to, I needed to be able to become, to, to perform that job that I was in well in order to save up enough to do something like Parkhurst. So there's not really a glitzy glamorous backstory. Like I didn't really, you know, go out and, to investors and raise millions of dollars to start yeah. a company. I don't know. Did it with maybe it's an old school mentality, just sacrifice and save, right? <laughs> Something yeah. like that. Um, but you know, you know, I got to a point when I was working at the bank, and I was like, you know, it's I was coming up on my fifth year at the time, and I was like, you know, when are you going to take action on this this Parkhurst idea, and and what's it going to be? Is it going to be boots? Is it going to be shoes? Is it going to be clothing is it going to be swim trunks is it going to be t-shirts like you know what what is it going to be right. um and uh you know i i just kind of decided that i needed to really pursue this and um not to mention like i was getting very burned out you know working for mm -hmm. the bank um and i just felt that at that time in my life like it was the appropriate time to make the shift make the change and um you know as one thing kind of led to another and at the time i had the um the factory i was working with was here in western new york and you know i was living in buffalo so it's like oh like this is it's like a 30 minute drive or so to the factory so you know i i approached them and um you know kind of tossed my idea to their management team and they were extremely kind and generous to even talk to me because like i'm nobody <laughs> i'm still nobody <laughs> i mean in, in, so, um, you know, next thing we know, we started developing samples and, and lasts and, and just kind of prototypes here and there. And eventually that's what led us into production. And by the time I hit production, I was coming up on like two months before I was getting ready to give my two week at the bank I was working at. And um, at that point, you know, we had I had some a couple of wholesale orders here and there. Uh, I was driving my grandfather's Buick <laughs> and selling boots out of the back of my trunk. <laughs> and there was, you know, it was just, you know, it, the, the early days were, were cool when starting up. Cause it's like, you don't, you know, you're pouring all your time and your energy into something in, in the hopes that it's going to grow or, or take you someplace. Real um, bootstrapping. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, right. I, and that's kind of like, part of the reason why it was like boots too. And, and, you know, my, my grandfather and my grandparents had a lot of influence in it too, because they grew up, uh, you know, with the great depression and during, you know, a time where, you know, there's world wars going on and things were tough. There wasn't always food. Like people didn't have a car, like, you know, it's, um, people didn't even ha always have clothing, like you not even access to hot water, the stuff that we take for granted by, seeing you know just um you know 
advertisements for everything everywhere right i mean yeah of course, i'm a little guilty of that too because i do run very very small budget advertising <laughs> but <laughs> um but i guess my point is um you know it was they were kind of an inspiration to me too because they were just uh it's almost as if they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And I was thinking to myself, like, oh, that phrase really does carry some meaning. And, um, you know, my grandfather, he worked in the steel mills a lot most of his life. And it was, he was just like, to me, like the symbol of like true grit, like hard work, like keep your head down, like stay focused, like do what you need to do, like, tune out all the noise around you. Don't pay attention to what anybody else is saying or telling you to do. Just, just go for it and do what you know is right. Get the job. You know what I mean? Like get the job done. Yeah. Um, so like a lot of my inspiration just in motivation kind of came from that too. Um, so like it just kind of all tied together into being boots. Like it all just whole thing to me just kind of felt like boots. <laughs> I don't know. It probably doesn't make sense, but yeah. Um, so yeah. uh, Parkhurst was named after the street your grandfather lived on. Yes. Uh, yep. 602 comes from his landing ship tank number. Yes. Yep. He was on. <laughs> so big inspiration. Big inspiration. Yeah. yeah. Big inspiration. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but my day job is a management yep. consultant. And one of yes. the things that, I, that really interests me oh, yeah. is why people start business. Uh, and, and, you know, um, how driven they are by it. And obviously your grandfather was part of that. But what else drives you? What, what's, what's that, um, that this Parkhurst boot thing must succeed? What, what is it inside you? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a yearning desire to, to succeed. Like, I, honestly, I really, I know it sounds cliche. I know it sounds kind of crazy probably but um you know it's just having the ability and in the resources that you know i've sacrificed so much for and received so much help from other people for um to make a better product to deliver better customer service to uh deliver better fit um and ultimately deliver a feeling of satisfaction to people um, and you know, the fact that I'm able to do this through something as simple as a pair of boots, um, you know, that brings a lot of joy to my heart, but it also gives me motivation to keep going. Um, I know I said something simple as a pair of boots. It's not simple. <laughs> it's <laughs> like all this stuff come together. Let me tell you. Um, <clears throat> but it's always, you know, I, I've, I've always just had this, you know, I was, I was raised like not to give up. Like I was raised not to, you know, I, I was raised to have like, you know, just like big goals. And like, I know everybody's, you know, raised like that too, but for, for whatever reason, like I just couldn't shake that. Like I just couldn't get it out of my head. The desire to, to create something, um, you know, and, 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 and give people a great product and give them great service. And, you know, I tried to take what I learned when working for the bank, because um, ultimately a lot of what I did was customer service. Like we had institutional clients. Um, so I try to take the customer service that I learned at the bank and apply it to the business. And there are two different fields, right? Um, do I give the best customer service? No. Um, but I try to, you know, be as positive and reasonable and as possible and help people out as much as I possibly can. Um, but you know, there's, I, 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 I think you talk yourself down there, Andrew, because, um, Why is that? in social media, just about everybody says, Andrew probably gives the best customer service. You know, you're, you're highly responsive. I try to be responsive, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of funny. You mentioned, um, being highly responsive. So like, I, I don't know if this is maybe where I get it from, but, you know, when I was working at the bank, I was responsible for managing an email inbox of, we received about, I don't know if this is a lot, like I, really working at the bank has been my only professional work experience, um, you know, in, in, in a corporation at least. <laughs> but I mean, the key I managed was anywhere between 
probably 400 to 700 emails a day. Um, and That's a we lot. had 30 to 50 phone calls that were incoming each day to uh, sometimes related to the email, sometimes not. But I think that, and like when, when you're working with, with stocks and finances, like you, you've got to be quick, right? You got to be fast. Cause if you don't take that phone call, you know, and the price moves or the currency moves and you have a client that you're trying to make whole or, you know, sell a position for, like they're going to come back to you as the broker and be like, Hey, what happened here? Why didn't you pick up your phone? Why didn't you answer your email quick enough? Um, I, I wasn't a trader or anything. I was just an analyst, but, um, you know, it was, uh, I, I feel like maybe I, maybe I've brought some of that responsiveness into the business, but even if I did, like, it's, it's just kind of, all I've known more or less bef like coming into the business. So I don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, there's a little story that, um, cause you and I have emailed, uh, in the past as I've been buying your boots, uh, and I've right. bombed you with emails about, you know, what's the fit and all that sort of stuff. But uh -huh. a couple of times, uh, I think it should be known a couple of times I've emailed you and said, I want that particular boot, but I need my credit card to clear. <laughs> and you put the size, oh. uh, you know, aside for me uh, for a for a week or so, which is yeah. extremely generous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, seen, I've, I've, I've done that with other customers, too. And I mean, like, honestly, it's not really that big of a deal. Like some of my customers, like they they have like currency accounts themselves that they keep for just like retail buying or buying off of websites and they'll buy it in like the local currency or they'll use their currency to do it. And they're like, Hey, I need like three business days for this to settle. And then I can purchase, you know, it's no big deal. Okay, fine. You know, I was just email me. I'll set the boots aside for you. I put a post it on the box before I ship them say, Hey, res reserved for tech. Oh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that's just, it's no big deal. I mean, as long as someone lets me know what they want to do, I'm game. <laughs> well, so. it's, it's very personal. It's very personal. Um, I want to go back to something you said about, you know, the bootstrapping of your business. Sure. There are others, and I'm not going to name names, but there are others that started with Kickstarter campaigns or they did go uh, to the market to get capital. Do you regret not getting that sort of base capital up as part of your history? Um, no, because every... Every time I was approached by an investor or um, or a, a VC company, it always came at such a cost, and that cost yeah. was chip of my company. And, and to this day, I own 100% of the shares of it. So um, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot uh, to have a, a well, a few very good mentors in my life, and um, you know, it's just. Every one of them, I didn't realize it like when I was first starting, but as Parkhurst has grown, I see the importance of, you know, quote unquote, hanging on to your business. Um, and it's not like I didn't like pay attention to it or think it was important back then. It's just that, you know, when you're first starting, it's like you're trying to sell boots so that you can, you know, make finance the next production order so you can <clears throat> bills, you know, just do, you know, whatever's got to be done. Right. Um, but I mean, I was approached by like this one, this one investor, like, you know, they had a, a pretty decent amount of a cash offer, but you know, the, the stake in the company was just, it was too big. I think at the time it was some like 35, 40%. Right. And yeah, the cash looks cool and everything, you know, being young and, and, and dumb, <laughs> frankly, right. I mean, when you're first starting, like you don't know everything. Right. So, um, <laughs> uh, um so you know and then there was this other investor who um you know I, I i won't really talk too much about it but you know he was big he was very very big um uh on tv plenty of times and that's all i'll say about it <laughs> um <laughs> You know, and, and they made me, you know, like a an offer that was like 70% of the company. And oh. I was like, it's like I had to negotiate down to the 70. Oh, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, yeah, I just. Yeah. That, that's that, that's like, not that's not an investment. That's a takeover. No, that's a takeover. <laughs> that's, is it somewhat hostile at that point? I don't know. <laughs> but um, it's very aggressive offer and deal but you know what it just kind of made me realize you know like 
uh, I was in like my what late twenties at the time. And, you know, I was, I was in my late twenties and living at home. I mean, screw it. That's what it was. I mean, you know, and, and I wanted to start the company and I, I had to, I had to live at home to save up enough money for my day job. And in order to be able to do something like this, cause I saw what, you know, what was going to happen with, um, with, with people who wanted to make investments in my company. And it always involved me losing a lot of control. Now, yeah. just back up a hot second here. I'm, I don't want to come across as a control freak, you know, cause I keep saying, I don't want to give up control, but at the same time, like I look back at these past few years and I, I see the things that I was able to do, the shifts that I was able to make, the, the, the contacts I was able to make, the factors I was able to work with. I don't think I would have been able to do that if I had a board, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't think I've been able to, and, and don't get me wrong, like Parkhurst isn't this, you know, massive company or whatever, but um, I don't think that I would have had the, the same type of success that I've had so far, um, be it small or, you know, however it's perceived. But um, yeah, I, I, I've thought about Kickstarter. I, I've thought about other things like that, but I don't know. I guess just everything. I, I'm happy with the way things are going. Like I, yep. I can't, I can't really complain. You know, am I growing the fastest? No. You know, but am I growing the slowest? No. But at the same time, like I'm having a good time just kind of servicing my current customer base and picking up new ones here and there. So, you know, if, if that's that's kind of where I stand with that. Yeah, I, I understand the control thing because it's um, there's business control or governance control. But but I think in a, in a company like yours, it, it filters down through everything. So there's design elements and so on that you just don't want to keep going through the layers, you know. So I totally yeah. understand that. But but um, yeah. I think one of the public things that we saw as customers uh, was mm-hmm. the COVID challenge that like your website, oh, yeah. you know, practically disappeared. Uh, yeah. And people who don't understand business sort of, oh, you know, became critical or Parker's doesn't have enough models and all that without understanding the investments in it. So right. um, how big a challenge was it? <laughs> so it, um, it was a bit, it, it was big. I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't want to go into too much of the nitty gritty stuff here, but, um, but hell, it's Friday night and I got some time. <laughs> so. And there's a beer afterwards. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, it's interesting because, like, it, it was, it was, it was difficult. I mean, it was difficult. I mean, that's, 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 you know, the one word to sum it up, right? I mean, I, I saw the factory that I worked with, like, you know, 30 minutes away from me go under. And, like, they, like, I knew the crew there. I knew the manager. I knew the owner. Like, it was, it was, it was tough seeing them because like seeing them go under, because it was, I mean, they, they brought this thing to life. Like when I was selling prototypes out of my trunk, like, so it was like, and in, into, in into scale and production with them, it, it was very difficult, um, to, to, to watch that happen. And, you know, I, even through COVID, you know, I was still submitting monthly purchase orders to them. I was still submitting monthly orders to my suppliers. And, um, you know, I would like to think that I, I did all that I could. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, it just kind of eventually turned into something that was bigger than them. It was bigger than me. Um, but yeah, it, it was tough. And regarding what you mentioned earlier, as as an example, um, it was it was tough. Also, just seeing like the comments that people were saying online about about Parkhurst, and I I, I feel like maybe there's an illusion that Parkhurst is like this huge company when yeah. it's really not. It's it's just me. Like the, like I'm in my warehouse now, so like yeah. I pack organize sort ship everything i do finishing touches here in the warehouse like gluing the heel pads cutting them sanding burnishing if there's any sewing that's got to be done you know just 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 random finishing stuff right so it's it was hard like because like not everybody knows right and um it, it was it was tough to see those comments because it's like i said not everybody knows like the 
the time, the effort, and frankly, the capital that's put into making this whole thing run and work. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, the website was bare. Like it was bare for a long time. And, you know, as soon as the factory shut down a week or so after, actually, I thought to myself, you know what? Um, uh, yeah, people got to know what's going on because there's going to be little to no inventory for probably a good nine, 10 months after. Um, so I, that's when I started the production update and, um, on, on my website and I, I guess I treated it more like a blog more than anything. Cause yeah. I tried to update it like twice a week or sometimes once a week. I'm sure there was, you know, some gaps in between, but, um, basically I wanted I didn't want my customers to feel let down just because a factory closed. Because the, the truth of the matter is, even before COVID, shoe factories in the United States in particular were closing left and right. I mean, it's just a fact of, you know, reality. And, um, you know, it just so happened that the one I was partnered with was, you know, one of the ones that was in business longer. So... You know, I wanted to do my part to try to help that part of the industry, right? But when I started doing the production update again, like I just I needed people who had been on this journey, who had been along for this ride for the past what was it three years at that time or something? Yeah. Uh, you know, to know that like, hey, I'm not just going to throw in the towel here. Like, I wasn't raised to just throw in the towel. Like something bigger and better can be done from this situation. And, um, you know, at, at that time, you know, it's like the, the factory closed and then I had, you know, there are even a few, um, tanneries here that ended up closing too. So it's like, I lost, you know, my supplies from them. Um, and really when a factory closes, like, and you're in mid production, which we were, I mean, you're talking, massive setbacks, massive delays, yeah. massive amounts of work in process boots, you know, massive amounts of, frankly, capital that was invested to, you know, produce what's being produced, right? Um, so it was, it was a little bit of a hit, but, you know, at that time, like, I had been searching high and low for additional factories to partner with in the U.S., and I had before, it's just that the one in the one in uh, Western New York in Batavia was my main one, um, just because they'd been around for the the longest, right? I mean, I I have worked with other factories in the U.S. before to do very small runs or prototyping and sampling, but by the time COVID actually arrived, they themselves had actually gone out of business, or they were, um, you know, on on the brink of, from what I saw. And it's, it's tough to make a, it's, it's tough to, it's, it's tough to see that kind of thing happen and also know that like the order I'm going to give them is going to be nowhere near enough what they need to sustain themselves for the next 30 business days. All so right. like that hurts me too. Cause it's like, I don't know, like I want to help, but at the same time, like if, if I don't have the tools to help or if i don't or if i'm just too young of a company to be able to make a significant impact mm. um that's also something i kind of had to realize too and people were telling me that left and right i didn't want to believe them but um you know that's kind of one of the things that i had to realize as well and, and it kind of led me to um production in spain um which has been a pretty big shift here um but honestly ultimately we ultimately we've been, we've been able to make a better quality product i think and um it's been hard to it's been hard for me to come to that um to come to that realization because like we we tried to make you know our our boots in the u.s up to a certain level of quality and specifications um you know that were desired by customers right and yeah. i think that for the most part we achieved a lot of what customers were generally looking for um but at the same time like one of the major setbacks with manufacturing uh with the factories that were still in business or open at the time here in the u.s um was that a lot of them simply didn't have machinery to like do things like use leather heel counters um they didn't have the proper nailing equipment to nail 
uh, heels the way that I wanted to nail them. Um, even right down to like soul stitching. It, it was like with every factory um, I visited, like there was always at least 20 to 25 percent of what I was looking for missing. Um, and as a business, when you're when you're getting emails and, and, and reach outs from customers asking for those very things that those very missing machines or even skilled labor at the time uh, would not possess, then yeah, I mean, it, it, it becomes it becomes tough. Um, but I'm lucky to be partnered with some really great people in Spain who are actually friends of the former factory <laughs> uh, that I used to work with here. So um, it's interesting, you know, that's more or less how I got introduced. Um, so, so it's interesting, like, the dynamic, like this, this, the shoe manufacturing industry is like, it seems big, but like when you're in it as a business, like you discover how small it actually is. <laughs> everybody knows everybody. Everybody seems to know everybody or know of everybody. So like, it's, you know, it's just one of those industries that's like it, I guess. <laughs> It's interesting, you know, because I, I I I was a big fan of the work coming out of the Batavia factory because I think there was a certain ruggedness uh, about it. But I think you're right, is that the Spanish factory pro pro provides something more consistent in, in what they do. Uh, it's just different. I think if, you, if you're looking for, um, this is where I show you one, uh, the good old fashioned iconic spruce kudu uh, from yep. the Batavian factory, yep. there's, there's just a certain ruggedness about it. Whereas yeah. um, the the current yeah. models are much more consistent and and um, dressier almost, you know. Yeah, I mean it's <clears throat> um, you know th this is something I've I've I I've seen for the entire time I've been doing this, and, and it's an interesting point you point you bring up actually. Um, I've worked with probably fourteen or fifteen different factories globally um, by now, and. Um, you know, I could give the same pattern, the same last, the same tooling, the same dyes to all these factories and tell them, please make me a sample. Please make me a prototype. When all, let's just, let's just say, 50, let's just use the number 15 to keep it, you know, a somewhat rounder number. All 15 of these factories finish a boot for me and they send them to me or I pick them up or whatever. And I guarantee you, they're all going to look different. <laughs> and because there's there's they just will and that's because like every set of hands at every factory sews something differently turns something differently yeah. pivots differently um you know there's a set of hands like staining the edging differently every time yeah. uh maybe you know one veg tan supplier is different than another veg tan supplier in the sense that you know in, in this in, with regards to like heel stacks midsoles yeah. or what like that like it's all you know generally they'll have they'll have what you want right it's just that it might just be ever so slightly different and you 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 combine that with different people you know again different sets of hands like involved in making these boots and turning them around the machines or or sanding them or nailing them or staining you know you, you pair all these different variables together and that's why there is really always going to be a difference between from one factory to the next but it's interesting though because when i was producing with the factory in, in here in western new york you know they produce for other like really big brands too yeah yeah like um, you know, I would almost argue, like, are there similarities between the other big ones they were producing for and mine and even amongst them? Yeah, of course, there were definitely similarities. But where I think a factory shines is in its ability to make something look completely different from something else they made, even though the build may be the actual same. Um, so, you know, that's why, you know, when we talk about, like, the 602 last line of production and the 602 M last line of production. Um, they're, they're just two different production lines. Um, but again, like at the factory in that was here in Western New York, um, they were making boots as many people know for other companies too, but yet we still were able to keep, 
uh, you know, our products, I would say different to a pretty decent level. I mean, I know there, I'm sure there are some people out there who would argue, oh, they all look the same or, you know, there are too many similarities and that's fine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting point you bring up because it, it is something that I've seen working with different suppliers and factories for sure. Do you like that? Because I do. I, I like the variation. Um, like personally? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's cool. I mean, what variety is the spice of life, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but kind of like what I mentioned, like earlier, earlier in our chat here, you know, it's like there, there are a decent amount of people out there who I do believe like they will only buy something if it's consistent every single time. Yeah. And there too. So what I try to keep consistent no matter what is, I mean, we may change the upper leathers around, we may change some components around like the eyelets, we may change the patterns, but as long as the last is the same and as long as it's consistent, because they're 3D printed, so they're relatively exact from um, place to place, you know, as long as there's some form of consistency that's held there, um, then, you know, it's it, it's okay with me, you know, if it's, if it's okay with everybody else. Yeah, probably. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those people yeah. should buy Timberland, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> a, a, a interesting point about switching to the Spanish factory, obviously, is you, you can't. I, I saw an interview with uh, the owner of the, the Batavia factory who said that you were a pretty hands on uh, kind of guy and you were in the factory quite often. What's it like not being yeah. able to drive around for 30 minutes to have a look at what's going on? Um, well, I mean, it's it's different but it's not bad like that's kind of one of the weird things about this though because like it's like well now i have like other responsibilities in my warehouse i have other responsibilities for shipping and fulfilling i have other responsibilities for design um you know for sourcing for you know prototyping with different factories i mean it, it, i do i do kind of miss the drives out there and being able to kind of go in and and see what was going on and, and look at my stuff actually being made um but at the same time like i also didn't want to like wear out my welcome because like <laughs> you gotta keep in mind like this is a very hard working group of people i mean they're you know in the factory using their hands they got machines running all the time it's hot um you know, they're trying to meet deadlines and produce a quality product, just like, you know, all of us are in our own careers. Right. So like it's, we had, I, I really enjoyed the relationship I had with them, but you know, it's, there, there are some times where it just, things are just too busy. And the last thing I'm going to do is show up when it's pandemonium. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, oh, what's this? Parker, yeah. Why yeah. I'm driving? I don't <laughs> yeah. know. But do you have any yeah. better? But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it. I do kind of miss it, but I mean, honestly, like right now, there are many other things that I'm trying to improve. You know, both with myself and with Parkhurst. So right. it's funny how you get like older and time goes by that like your priorities kind of like shift. They kind of change, sure. and like stuff you you used to enjoy doing a lot it's like you know you look back and you and you might be like oh hey yeah that was a great time but like you know the time that i'm in now like is arguably it could be even better so yeah, yeah. There, there must be one thing you miss though like like being at the end of the line and having a look oh, and going oh just change that stitch oh, you yeah. know that takes a week right <laughs> so like um oh like rick was one of the guys there who um I got, a, I, I feel like I got along with him pretty good, <laughs> but like he would always be like toward, um, the end of the line, like doing the sole stitching or the heels and, and like people, you know, switched up to do different tasks in different production stages throughout the factory. So, um, I, I can't really like speak specifically for or directly for people you know at the factory because you know i i wasn't i i wasn't them right um but like it was always kind of cool like finish or seeing the the finishing racks where the boots were like just coming out from you know having the the stain applied or from having the heels just put on or from 
or, or from having them ran under the heat one last time. I mean, like we, we there were boots that were ran under heat like constantly. Like it would be like a, a small blowtorch or just like a heat gun even. Or I mean, there I mean you can get machines that you know they're they're just industrial machines that just blow out like hot air similar to what a heat gun would do, and you just do that to try to like bring a little bit more color and life to the texture of the leather, like bring the oils and waxes to the surface. Um, you know, kind of like how you have a sort of like a pull-up effect almost. Like when you run your hand along a, a leather, you can see the waxes and the oils separate, you know, from the pressure. Well, running it under heat um, can help both bring oils and waxes to the surface, or it can also put them back into the leather, depending if they had already been on them before. Right. So that's why over here I keep a blow dryer and a heat gun in my warehouse in case huh? I need to do it. <laughs> in case right. I need to do any of that before I send out a pair. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I I do I do miss it, right? Like I do I do miss it. Um, but you, you know, kind of like what I said earlier, like I I have other obligations, you know, in, in the terms of meeting customer needs and meeting customer demands and in working with the, the the new factories and stuff too so yeah okay um let's talk last uh old favorite the 18 this is my very first <laughs> parker's boot the spalding was that uh, the natural excel or the it is, yeah natural chrome natural? excel yeah it's okay. now i mean you can see how old it is now it's oh, really yeah, quite dark brown like nat natural always gets to be that dark color beautiful my mind is gorgeous but yeah beautiful <laughs> Um, yeah, the eight, yeah. <laughs> fan favorite. Will it come back? I know. Yeah. Um, honestly, I have no plans to bring it back. Um, right. I, I got to be perfectly honest. That last was um, it was the first last I launched with. Right. But it, it just had. I don't know. I, I, I feel like it worked for half the people who had it and it didn't work yeah. for half the people who bought it. And, it, you know, it's just. Some people, there wasn't enough room in the toe. Others, there was too much in the arch. There was too much in the heel. And everybody's foot's going to be different and fit differently, right? So, um, yeah, that one, I'm sorry to say, but I, I have no plans to bring it back. I see yeah. people online saying, like, oh, bring back the 18. And I, I thought it was a small hashtag or something for bring back the 18. Who knows? Um, yeah, it's just, unfortunately sorry yeah <laughs> I have, I have no yeah I, I, I people's feet are different i mean i pe people yeah. uh, make make comments on my videos like oh i wear such and such and this what shall i wear in xyz and i'm like don't ask me i'm just telling you how my feet work you know <laughs> you got to figure it out um yeah. but what was the what what inspired the 602 last um well a lot of stuff that didn't work from the 18. <laughs> <laughs> If I'm being really, really frank here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean, like, you know, we, I, 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 I took what the feedback I got from my awesome customers with regards to what, what didn't work for them with the 18 last, or maybe what they would see want to be improved. Um, like, I knew I wanted to make a little bit rounder of a toe box. I think the 18 last had the almond taper was maybe a little bit too pointy. Um, but the, the the idea with the 602 last was to, I, I, I was in, in, with, in my own mind or in, with my own objective to, to create just a little bit more of a sleeker, but roomier last too. And I don't know if I have achieved it or not, frankly. I, I mean, I look at some boots and I'm like, yeah, it, it kind of looks, you know, a little bit, maybe sleeker maybe cooler i don't know um but then i then like i'll look at some other boots and maybe it's probably just the upper leather that's being used to be honest but i look at other boots with like a different leather and be like oh man this looks like like not at all what i wanted it to look like <laughs> but but like this is how this is how production turns out sometimes like you can order or make a last sample you know, you, you give it to a factory or two and they make it up. And going back to what I said earlier, right? Like every factory is going to yeah. make something not different, right? Well, the same thing happens with lasts too. Yeah. Uh, so it becomes, you know, it, it becomes a game of, uh, of just putting a giant puzzle together, kind of. 
like what piece you want to, or what piece is going to fit where. And, um, you know, the, the 602 was a culmination of fixing some, or making improvements rather from the 18 last, but also making a last that was kind of originally what I wanted the 18 to be like. I wanted the 18 to be a little bit more lower profile, um, uh, a little bit more sleek and, I, I know there are some customers out there who have already told me, oh, but the 18 lasts already, you know, for them, it's it's sleek and for them, it's low profile. Um, but, you know, for, you know, other customers, they would say the same. They would say the opposite of that. Right. They'd be like, well, you know, it could be a little bit, you know, you know, maybe a little bit more sleeker, maybe a little, a little bit more open in the toe box and that. So um, it, it's kind of a combination of everything yeah. there. Just yeah. like the six up. Yeah. I think people like the 18 because it is slimmer and dressier. But the 602, I think, mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty sure would fit most uh, most feet rather than uh, you know a small selection. Yeah. But you made some adjustments to it, right? When you when you started producing in Spain, you uh, made it a little bit higher so, volume, was it? So it just so so here here's the crazy thing, um, and and I I, I know I've told a, a couple of people this. I don't know how you know how word circulates or how fast it does but so when we move production to spain it's actually the same last the reason why there's more volume that got added to it was because there was or or at least the illusion or the feeling that there's more volume added to it is because we started using like thicker and different internal components so like the biggest example of that is you know we were using just a slightly thicker, like for the insole, for example, it's veg tan Benz leather. Um, we were using just an ever so slightly thicker one, maybe like by a half a millimeter. But right. then we started using like the leather heel counters, which is something that factories in the States couldn't do because they didn't have the machinery to do it. And, um, you know, so pairing that with using like thicker upper leathers and different leathers and different welts and different midsoles. And, and what I'm, what I'm trying to say is when you combine all these things together, you don't always get the same boot that you had from a previous factory, especially one who's using different components. So if we were to take an example, um, like I'm looking, I keep looking at this snuff moose boot here, you know, we're, the leather heel counters on these, right? So um, before, like, and you can almost kind of tell, like it does take up some, it yeah. does almost yeah. like a it's round, yeah, back, right? More round, yeah. Um, which is something I actually tailored a little bit more for the current drops that I just did today. We kind of tailored it more to the heel of the last, but, but going back to this example, um, when you're wrapping and building, wrapping these thicker leather components or upper leathers even around a last, they don't hug as tight around the last, even if it's hand lasted or pulled over by a machine, they don't hug and hold as tight as other internal components um, that I've even worked with in the past do. So as an example, um, back in the day and when we were producing the factory in New York, we were using uh, thermoselastic uh, heel counters. So they were great because they were easy to work with. Like they were really easy to work with in production and the machines worked well with them too. We didn't have to constantly, you know, recalibrate anything. Things weren't breaking. We didn't have to, or, well, the factory didn't have to send away for replacement parts. We didn't have to, um, you know, or they didn't have to have like a dedicated repair person to you know the machine that that made or molded rather the heel counters but so as a result of that like i would almost say that with the build that i had in the western new york factory i would almost say that the boots probably fit more snug on people than they do now having made these different upgrades and the only reason why well well this really the second reason why i say that in addition to components is um because I've had customers who they've tried my boots in the past and they've ultimately returned them because they, the fit just didn't work for them, right? On the previous build here in Western New York. But when they try the ones that are Spanish built, um, you know, it was, it, it worked for them. Yeah. So 
you know, that, that kind of tells me and and I, I try to take in all these little data points during production and feedback and fit. Um, you know, that kind of tells me that, you know, this is this is how it this is kind of how it played out. So it's, it's yeah. interesting you say it's the same last because uh, what, uh, it seems bigger, right? New like York and yep. Spanish look exactly the same, but I, I feel it's bigger in from the Spanish one. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of it has come down to the components used. I mean, even I mean, this is going to sound really nuts, but like I've even used, you know, the cork that goes inside, like yeah. like the cavity, like yeah. where the rip. Yeah. So like that that channel that the the cork goes in. Um, I mean, I've even used and again. Bear with me on this because I know it's going to sound nuts. I even use different size cork filler to fill that, and I'll still notice a difference in fit of the. Info. I know I sound, but it's it's little it's little stuff like this that if uh, unless you actually try it and see it, it's like, and most people probably aren't even gonna like you know think twice about it, right? Yeah, like no. Yeah. It's because, like, you know, I'm I'm seeing it, right? And, like, I'm feeling yeah. it, I'm holding it. And ultimately, hey, like, I feel a sense of responsibility to the customer as well. Like, hey, if this fits changed, then, you know, then, then it's changed because of the build. I mean, when yeah. we get into using, um, like, thicker upper leathers or, or different, even different articles of upper leathers, and, and I'm sure there's people, there are people who can attest to this because, they've emailed me about it but even those boots might fit them differently yeah I, mean, I know that when we were making like the spruce kudu for example and we were making them in the batavia factory um with the components that we were able to get you know within the u.s at the time before um you know a lot of people went out of business um again like that boot was running a little bit more snug for people than it is in the same spruce kudu model let's say for something that's you know built in spain so there is there it sounds crazy right I yeah. mean, but there is I, some truth to it i i bought two boots once at the same time it was the light natural sidle uh double shot and the veg retan yes uh, two richmond boots bought at yep, the same I'll time best. fit differently yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you like that that's that sidel veg retan leather um uh, yeah, Seidel is such a great tanner uh, to work with. Um, I mean, really, they all they all are. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, like, so that one too, like another leather article that can kind of throw people for a little bit of a loop because you have a, a, a double a double shot leather, which is like by the time they finish it, it's got like this like supple nice shiny kind of smooth finish it wraps around the last really nice in production you know it comes out well it pulls over well um it can be sewn underneath the insole really well and you know the the, the side of the veg retan ones that is a stiffer drier leather and working with that in production usually leads to the upper leather not being able to be wrapped around the last as tightly. I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that your veg retans probably felt a little bit bigger and stiffer than the double shots. Yep. Is that yep. about right? That's okay. right. And, and and that's really that's why. I mean, the, that that particular veg retan model or article rather from Seidel, that was a dry, stiff leather. Um, you know, the, the veg retan model I have now on the Niagara model, you know, we were able to change a few things up in the tanning process for it so that it actually comes out more soft and a little bit more supple. Now, is it yeah. a supple like double shot or Cremexo? No, but it's not like dry and stiff. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I did like that stiffness. I, I, I conditioned oh, it with a, yeah. with a little bit of uh, big four, which I kind of regret because it made it. Darker. less less of uh, matte oh yeah. yeah 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 you take a hair dryer and if you apply if you like run heat over it for a minute or two it, it might change it a little bit too okay i'm, I'm going to try that um yeah tell me about this one 
the Nick <laughs> collaboration. How did that yeah. come about? It's crazy, right? Um, Beautiful. It's 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 crazy. You know, I was ta- so I, I was talking to uh, the CEO of Nix uh, one day, and um, uh, Shyler, like super great guy, really into boots. You know, just like me, and um, you know, such an honor to talk to him. Really, like it was an honor that somebody from Nix was talking to you know some small fish in the pond like me to begin with. <laughs> so like, so I was like super ecstatic, even just the be acknowledged right next thing you know he's in buffalo and we're getting brunch together <laughs> and uh, discussing like boot stuff here and um I, I was like i was so appreciative of his time and and really the entire staff at nick's boots time and attention to doing this um i, I mean it was it was it was crazy i mean the clap the collaboration boot went went really well a lot of interest um i know at the time of this recording what is say september 1st yeah september yep. 1st um there's still a lot of orders for people that have to be made and shipped out but i'm just so grateful that nix was able to squeeze this project in with their regular production i, I gather more or less and um yeah i mean the, the idea behind this was to you know, we, we were sitting and talking and, you know, we had some phone calls and and all that with, you know, to, the, with me, with his team and, and, and Shyler with me. And, you know, I told him, I was like, you know, what if we did something where we kind of combined the two boot worlds here? Because, like, we, we look at a lot, I mean, well, at least the way I viewed this, and maybe this isn't a popular view or maybe I'm wrong here, but um, the way I kind of view the boot market right now is, like, everybody's out to do their own thing, to make their own design, their own thing that they're going to be known for, right? There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's what like most designers and brands come to thrive on and, and do, right? Sure. So like this one was different in the sense that I haven't really seen, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I haven't really seen another boot company announce and do something like this to the extent that we both did you know we because like i wanted to kind of create the, the the best of both worlds like i have a a pretty decent amount of customers who tend to like the fit of my 602 laps and they like the the profile of it and you know how it looks right the silhouette but at the same time you know it's like wouldn't it be wild if we just like threw like a traditional pacific northwest like boot build like in with this last just to see what would happen like so you know next thing we know we're just kind of again just doing some sampling and prototyping and we're like oh this actually looks pretty cool and then we just kind of started getting into talking logistics and you know if we were to do a, a group order how we would do it and ultimately you know we were just like you know what let's take let's take the 602 last and uh, I, I don't don't quote me on this, but I think Nix might have said something like, uh, "We'll just open up all of our leathers or a, a ton of our leathers to it or something, and we'll let people choose." And all, and that's what happened. Yeah. Um, so is it a best representation of the best of both worlds, whatever both worlds may be? Um, yeah. You know, four hundred dollar Goodyear welt boot versus you know the the, the tank of a Pacific North Northwest. Yeah. Um, and we'll just see how they kind of fuse together. And like, I don't know, for me, it was more about a collaboration, like unity type thing. Um, so yeah, like, I'm just really grateful to be able to work with them and I'm really grateful for their time and all the energy they've put into making this become a reality and, and talking to me about it. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's great. I've, I've loved uh, putting them on. They, they are, they 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 feel different. They fit the same, but I think they're um, built on their their sort of arch system. Yes. They feel it a little bit longer, but I, I as I said to you on email, I think eventually as it settles in, it should it should uh, be the so, same. But I love it. Yeah. Love that's it. one thing. That's one thing um, that like I noticed during when we were like doing prototypes and stuff, and um, with their build, like their build is like I mean everyone knows the build of Nix, like it's rock solid. <laughs> um so one of the things that i did notice was you know with the way they build the arch and um 
the way like a lot of like the, the hand lasting and the sewing and the, the different heel counter pattern. And, it, and again, like, it's kind of like what I mentioned earlier, right? It's a different factory. It's all different, more or less different, you know, dimensions of components if we really want to boil it down. Um, and, and when you bring all those things together, it does produce ultimately something different, right? But at the same time, different is what we're looking to achieve. So taking that into consideration, you know, that's why I put up on the pre-order page. I was like, you know, I forget how exactly, what exactly I said, but I, I do believe I said something to the extent of, you know, the, these are going to fit snug. The instep is going to be more snug because the way the arch is, um, you know, with the build, with all the components, the stitch down construction, things will feel a bit more like snug. Like you might feel snugness in places you wouldn't feel with like one of my boots, even though the last is the same. Um, yeah. it, pattern too right like their pattern is ultimately different the tongue's different the lacing's different um the, the eyelet dimension different. And, and stitch stitch down versus good year well that must create a difference exactly exactly so um you know pairing all those things together like it it, it was um we, we felt comfortable making like the same size to size comparison so like if you were taking like if you so for example if you're like a d a right on d width say you're a size eight um you know we would recommend an eight in this collaboration boot and you know so far it seems to be working for yeah. uh many people so um you know having said that it's probably not going to work for every single person um you know and that's where you know i'm happy to provide any size and guidance on that you know when when needed but yeah, I mean, like it was. I remember when I got the samples and I started wearing some of the samples around, and I was thinking to myself, is is like over the course of like one afternoon, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I started out wearing them in the early afternoon, then come dinner time, you know, earlier I was like, wow, these are these are snug. Is this is this my last? Like I was I was thinking about that, but then like you know, come five six o'clock or whatever, I was like. Oh man, these things feel like slippers. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah they settle in. They settle in. I I got the brown chrome XL because it, it was a quick ship, uh, but there are some yeah. really really beautiful Nyx leathers out yeah. there that's still coming out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, like some of those like seven eight ounce leathers they use, like those ones shouldn't fit as like snug, but they're definitely going to be stiff to break in. But they they might feel a little snug. I don't know. But what I do know is that you know if your hand lasting a seven or eight ounce leather as opposed to hand lasting a four and a half five or five and a half ounce leather it's kind of like what i said earlier like it it's going to hold to the last differently right because there's not going to be as much as much space or volume mm -hmm. because due to the leather weight and the thickness so so yeah it's yeah yeah <laughs> so so it's a v1 is there going to be a v2 <laughs> good question um I don't know yet. I think our I think our focus right now is just to fulfill all the orders and get feedback from customers first, and you know just take that feedback into consideration, and we'll have to see if there's going to be a, a, a V2 or not. <laughs> Terrific. Um, let's uh, we might finish off with talking about where you're going. Uh, you, you've been bringing out your own leathers and in fact your own outsoles like you you, you have your own commando sole you now have your own um uh, rubber studded sole like I would call it a day yeah. night but it's similar um sure. what what further plans have you got what's coming up well i mean right now it's been it's been a pretty big effort just to get to like customize soles and heels to begin with so I do think for the foreseeable future, there's going to be in in by foreseeable future, I would probably say through early next year, maybe spring next year, we're probably going to be using a lot of the um, in-house made like studded soles, commando soles. There's a couple of cork options I might throw in there too. Um, but, you know, cork is one of those things. It's like uh, some people love it and some people hate it. Like I'm yeah. kind of, 50 50 split down the middle so like usually in a in a situation like that you know it just it just depends and it could just be literally the people who i'm talking to it could have just been the sample size right um so in terms of souls that's that's kind of what we're doing but you know with the, the with one of the spanish tanneries i work with they're in the same town as the factory 
And what's cool about manufacturing in Spain so far is that everybody seems to be like within the same town. Like there's so many shoemaking <laughs> operations in Spain. Like it's 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 cra- it's something I never really knew until I actually started looking into it and learning about it. And um, you know, it's like it, it it's almost familial too, because like you'll have something where like somebody owns the shoe factory, right? But then like I don't know, their brother owns a rubber company that makes outsoles and heel top lifts for the shoe factory. Oh, but they're in the next town over a 20 minute truck drive away. Oh, but but then it's like, well, maybe, you know, the 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 the, the man or woman who owns the, the rubber factory, you know, their childhood best friend just happens to own the only veg tanning uh, leather <laughs> can for a hundred mile radius or something like, like everybody seems to just know. And, and honestly, like that's, that's to me what I think is cool about it because I mean, to, to be very blunt and honest here, like the biggest thing that hurt me doing a hundred percent manufacturing is the U in the U S is when the supply chains took a hit and when the labor yeah. crisis manifested, um, you know, when you're making a pair of boots, you got you can have anywhere between like 20, 25 different components coming together. And each component usually is coming from a different place, right? So yeah. you're juggling all these different places to try to bring everything together to make one pair of boots, right? So like in in Spain, like for me, it's, I mean, when it comes to that, it's worked really good, but like we're also able to get quality components as a result of it too. Um, you know, with that kind of stuff happening in the in the U.S., I, I would have been, I'm, I would have had to close down the company and be out of business in a heartbeat. But, but anyways, that's how things are. That's how things seem to be set up in Spain right now. And um, so far, it's been working. So far, it's been working really well. And I'm and I'm mm-hmm. looking forward looking forward to seeing you know what's going to play out more in the future. And in the meantime, we're just we're still doing things like experimenting with tanning you know just different custom colors and yeah. of, of upper leathers and different articles of upper leathers and stuff like that too so and at the same time like i'm still able to work with Seidel and uh uh horween and and cf stad and kind of still able to bring you know all the the heavy hitting tanneries all together you know into my production but we're, but i'm also able to bring some more custom stuff uh to the production line as well so I mean, yeah, there's, uh, there, there, there's always, there's always something going on, right? Like there's always something being worked on. There's always, <laughs> the question is whether it's going to make it to production or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that I see in, in my view of the Parker's DNA, I've got a pair of Weiberg service boots on right now. And I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, I've publicly said, why would you need Weibergs when you've got Parker's? Because one of the things that I see in, in the Parker's DNA is that your your service boot pattern, I mean, go back to the spruce kudu, your service yep. boot pattern is a classic service boot pattern. But what you do in Parkhurst is you find mm. interesting uppers and then you change it up with, you know, with different yep. outsoles. Is that something intentional? I mean, it, it is, right? I mean, like, it's you got to have some variety in what you're doing in order to, in order to better serve your your customer i i, I mean like I've, I've thought about having you know things like like this year was the first year i did a core a core line of of leathers if you will and it was the the waxy leathers so like mm. the black in the two the, the allen and the rust waxy um i i don't put myself in the same category as viberg i mean they're like the king of the hill as far as i'm concerned <laughs> but in price uh, too well yeah i mean but <laughs> I mean, look, they make an they make an incredible boot. I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, and, um, and and yeah, I mean, like, but you know, price I think is just all price is relative. I mean, it's all relative. You know, I I, I say on my website, and I've I've had you know many discussions with prospective customers. You know, it's for me, I price my products according to literally what it costs to make them and what it costs to sell them. It's that simple. That's just there's no, I mean, I see a lot of brands that like try to break down like some kind of like markup or like a, or like a retail type of markup. 
I don't do retail, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> you want you want to come to my website, send me an email, I'll hook you up. I mean, that's you know. So, but I think it's I think it's important to have you know some variety, right? And I'll always try to have some variety, but it is it is intentional because I, I want to be able to constantly offer something different and it kind of goes back to what i was saying like i want my customers to have that feeling that they got something that's a little bit more unique or like a one-off run i mean most of my boots pretty much are one-off runs i mean i know i've restocked like the spruce kudu gaucho moose snuff moose and um cumulus and camel kudu yeah Yeah. Yeah. that was it um well, that's like six boots or so right there. But but for the most part, like I, don't, I usually don't do restocks, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I just want to try to give people, you know, a variety and just try to make the pair that they ultimately get just a little bit more special to them. Well, that's a good place to finish, Andrew. We kind of circled around to the variety uh, aspect. So that's great. Was there any uh, last messages that you might want to give to your customers? Um. Honestly, like, I just, I just want to thank everybody, like, from the bottom of my heart for literally just sticking with Parkhurst through crazy tumultuous times. And I'm so thankful for the people who haven't lost faith in me, um, haven't lost faith in the factories I work with, the suppliers that I work with, because it's not, it's not like, you know, I say, you know, Parkhurst is just me, you know, but the the truth is it's not like Parkhurst really is like, it's everybody with whom I work. Like it's the factories, it's the suppliers, it's, it's, it's everybody. I mean, it's my mentors. It's like, I wouldn't be able to do this. Parkhurst wouldn't be able to be at the point where it is at now, if it wasn't for all these other like outside influences and forces that have helped catapult you know parkers to where it's at now so and and really the, the bedrock of that is or are, are my customers really because without their support like we the, the train doesn't keep moving right i mean the trains and that train almost when the factory closed here and when covid got bad and and the labor crisis manifested and the supply chain crisis manifested so yeah i mean you know, I I really appreciate everybody's patience and in, in working with me and in um, allowing me time to respond to their emails and to be transparent as transparent with them as I possibly can about what was going on. I I really hope I painted a decent picture for everybody um, as to what was going on, what was happening, what next steps were. Um, I hope I was on time for everybody. And, you know, when we, when I relaunched in January of this year and, um, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful and humbled because I, I I can't do this without all you guys. (laughs) I can't, and neither could factories because the customers ultimately are supporting, you know, my suppliers are supporting the tanneries and they're supporting the factories too. So it's, we're all interconnected here. So it's, it's really effort. We are, we are. Um, you have a lot of fans, Andrew. I, I, I see that from my from the comments coming in from the reviews. I, I see that on my posts on Instagram. People are loving your brand and yourself. I think, which is which is really fantastic. Well, as long as they like the boots, that's, <laughs> that's <okay. laughs> all right. Well, um, I'll just do a final message to the viewers. I, I hope you like that. Uh, don't forget to click on like and subscribe, uh, of course. And Andrew, thank you very much for your time. I was very excited to uh, get to talk to you like this, and I'm even more excited now that we have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it, man. I'll talk to you soon, all right? Talk to you soon.